we made something over at at Tone Den by operating in this environment of uncertainty and, and seeing these cool new kind of products come out of it. That's the way things should be. But that's also how music is made too, right? So like any kind of new like sound that's inherently made, you know, you're you're adding a little bit of a, a little bit of like an extra, uh, you know, bit of knowledge to the world that didn't exist before. When I look at the the dots and connect them, looking backwards instead of forward, that's what puts the biggest smile on my face. Well, here we are with Ali Shakari. So for everyone out there listening, Ali here is one of the founders of the revolutionary music marketing platform, Tone Den. He laughs that I called it revolutionary, but hey, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Ali, big fan of your work. Tone Den helps me out a lot with what I do. So man, so glad to have you on the show here. Thanks, Dan. It means a lot. Uh, I wouldn't say revolutionary, but uh, we, we definitely helped a lot of people out by, by being in the right place at the right time. It, uh, it is appreciated. Mm. So to start this off, you know, I want to go beneath the surface. Looking back, your life as an entrepreneur, your, your achievements that, you know, you've been in the right place at the right time to, to have. I'm curious, with all your success, what have you, what have you learned brings you the deepest fulfillment? in life kind of aside from your success Ooh, man, we're starting with the heavy hitting uh questions first on on that end well um there's a video that i find myself watching again and again as i reach different points of my life that i consider to be crossroads and it happens to be uh, Steve Jobs is an uh, infamous stay hungry, stay foolish speech. And I think with, with millennial grads, it's relatively well known. I graduated Berkeley in, in 2013. And um, I think it had come out like the year before that on that end. So a lot of people are relatively familiar with it. For Gen Z, you know, they're like, what do you mean that stay hungry, stay foolish speech? And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? But for anyone, excuse me, that uh, is uh, unfamiliar with it. Uh, Steve Jobs basically gave a commencement speech at Stanford. And one of the takeaways that he had was that for him, he, he didn't really plan out his life. And for him, he could only really connect the dots of like his life and, and his success looking backwards as opposed to, to forwards. And by that, I mean, you know, he said, hey, you know, at one point in my life, I had uh, been fired by the board at Apple, which is the company that I had started, and I felt like a failure. Uh, but that firing turned out to be an opportunity in disguise, because he was then able to go ahead and start uh, Next and Pixar, which then ended up being acquired by Apple, which gave him a new kind of creative skill set that let him, you know, get Apple to where it is today with, with the iPhone. And for him, he said, look, I wouldn't have been able to predict that any, any of those things have happened. So you have to have uh, some level of faith or trust in whatever your process is to, to keep you going. Um, I think on, on my end, what I've realized though is working with the right people, I think matters just as much as the impact of what your day-to-day -day work is. Uh, for me, I was very fortunate enough to uh, work with my my best friends and and start a company, and it was very hard, uh, but it didn't feel like work in the same way that uh, other jobs that I've had that were were similar on the diff difficulty scale, uh, but not quite the same in terms of just surrounding yourself. Uh, with with the right right people on that end, so that was a little bit of a long winded uh, answer. But for me, I, I feel like what's most important is surrounding myself with uh, the right community because you're going to be spending a lot of time, uh, you know, going out and and driving whatever impact you want on the world, or even if you're just trying to earn, earn a earn a living, uh, an honest living on that end. Uh, being around the right people, I think, is is really important. Yes, yeah, yeah. So you're saying it's like what you've learned brings you the most fulfillment is 
your your love of the craft, your love of the game, and then also like loving your team that you're playing with and just that journey itself? There's this concept of like flow, right? Where you're you're in an activity and you know, there's no other thoughts kind of coming in and out. It's just pure focus on whatever you're doing. And that's really, uh, uh, you know, blissful for a lot of people, right? Some people achieve it through meditation, other people through running, other people through sports. Um, and I think for, for some people, they're able to experience that in their professional career. Uh, but what happens if, uh, you know, the way that modern society is structured and the way that we're supposed to make their you know, money you know, what if you, you can't really make money and experience the flow state at the same time, you know, uh, if I'm out there and, and you know, one of my uh, superpowers is uh, figuring out and educating people on why they should be doing things uh, differently than they're currently doing and ideally choosing my product or service in order to do so, that doesn't leave as much room for the flow state as, uh, you know, say, trying to uh, re reach enlightenment on, on a mountaintop in, in Tibet. Uh, so for me, it's like, okay, if uh, I need to figure out how to survive in this modern capitalist society and uh, the things that uh, do put me in a sense of, of flow state, I can't do professionally, uh, right? I really love playing volleyball, but a little bit too short to be playing professional volleyball. <laughs> uh, I, I need to find something else that uh, can make make my day to day uh, livable and enjoyable. And for me, it's it's surrounding myself with good people. And I tend to have a little bit more control over who I can surround myself with if uh, I'm either running the show or or have a large stake in the business that uh, that I'm operating. <laughs> mm. So talking specifically about Tone Den. So Tone Den's acquired by Eventbrite, yes? Yeah, that's uh, correct. We were acquired in uh, November of 2020 on that end. So for people listening who, who may not know, can you just kind of briefly explain Tone Den and your, your ultimate vision behind it? Yeah. So um, my, um, uh, I started Tone Den with two of, uh, two of my best friends from college, uh, Tim Tamaya and Nick Ellsbury. And Tim, my, my co-founder and CEO, had actually had the idea for Tone Den actually way back in, in high school. Um, he had really loved using MySpace. And I know I'm, I'm dating myself here, uh, but he was really big into MySpace and building personalized websites. And that's actually how we marketed his band in, in high school. And he was like, hey, why don't I build this uh, nice way for a musician to quickly build an online presence? And Right when we were graduating college and trying to figure out what we had wanted to do, Tim approached me and said, hey, you're one of the few friends that I have that's actually interested in starting a company. Uh, I have a few ideas. You know, would you ever be interested in starting one? And for me, uh, I knew that I eventually wanted to start my own company. It would likely be a technology company, but I wasn't a... Uh, a developer so I couldn't actually build something and I looked at it and I was like yeah man I mean I, I'd love to start a company with you I there's literally no one else I could think of that you know, I would consider starting a company with right 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 now um, and I'd say about a few months later he came back with uh, a MVP which in in tech speak is a, a minimum viable product or a little prototype basically uh, the initial uh, idea behind Tone Den, which was as a musician, you can come to a website, uh, sign in with your SoundCloud account, and then boom, you've got uh, a website and an EPK. And while that might not sound as uh, as big of a deal, you know, nowadays, like there wasn't really like Wix in 2013. There wasn't really like a Squarespace, like the concept of uh, of like no code to be able to build a website was just, it was either just getting started or it hadn't necessarily been done yet. So uh, we, we kind of got started there and it, it, it took off very organically, right? Like we didn't quit our, quit our jobs right away. Um, I went out and found like a few uh, initial test uh, customers, but in the process of, of doing that, you really start to learn as like an entrepreneur, like, how to suss out like feedback when you're talking with people because everyone's so nice initially they're like oh yeah you know of course i'd love for you to make this for me 
and we'd, we'd make them a nice little website and they wouldn't share it. And I'd say we didn't really evolve as a business until we stopped being afraid of asking the tough questions directly, which is like, Hey, like, why aren't you sharing this? What would, what would make you actually share this website? And what was revealing was someone saying, look, we're happy with the way the website looks, but for us, we need to actually get more SoundCloud followers because that's what's actually going to get me a booking agent, or that's what's actually going to get me an offer at an event. And uh, at that point, I made the <laughs> the transcendental leap as an entrepreneur to be like, oh, okay, you actually just have to make something that people want, not what you want, but what your customer actually wants. Make something that people want and are willing to pay for. Because you can make something that people want, they'll go ahead and use it, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're going to pay for it. But mm. uh, that caused us to go down this road of uh, basically building tools that would help any musician, regardless of whatever their budget is, uh, grow on the social media platforms that matter to them. Well, if you made it this far, thank you for listening. Just want to let y'all know we've got these hand-dyed, ice-dyed, weird music podcast tees. And we're also going to be making some sweatshirts. So if you'd like one, let us know. We'd love to get you one. Also want to give a big shout out to the geniuses over at Thrax CBD for sponsoring this show with their amazing products. Got a link in the description. Also, big thank you to our sponsor, J&J Distribution, Ohio's premier CBD and Delta 8 wholesale supplier. Retailers, check out their brands, Kush Burst, three chi thc edibles and cbd md and also want to give a big thank you to our local print shop franklinton press if you need any custom merch or custom printing hit them up they'll take good care of you we got links in the description and yeah much love y'all now back to the show i want to jump to the side and so you know a good portion of our listeners are up and coming musicians themselves and so from your perspective i'd love you to talk to me about some of the things you admire about some different artists in terms of the way they market themselves and promote their brand? Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of my uh, artists, excuse me, a lot of my uh, examples are uh, rooted in dance music because that's what I, I really like. But uh, I'm going to wax philosophical here. What, what I'm going to say is like the the meta or the overall strategy for for getting big online uh, or just growing your brand as a musician, it actually changes like every couple of years because the way that people are discovering music changes and then the, the ease in which you can grow within certain channels changes. So to give you a quick, quick idea of what I'm talking about, the you know, we'll call it like the 2009 like to 2012 like era. That's all like blogosphere, right? You've got, remember like Hype, Hype Machine, how people would be like, hey, like part my song on Hype Machine so that I can go ahead and get to the top of the charts. Like you, you went from a, an era where music was largely like discovered through like internet blogs and and old school like a and methods like going to south by southwest to sign artists to you know we'll call it like the 2013 to 2000 like 18 or 19 area where you've got this like solid like five to six year period of time where uh playlists are really driving a lot of the growth uh but there were a lot of opportunities to get into playlists because the the major streaming platforms hadn't necessarily uh, really solidified their grip on what could be included in a playlist and what couldn't. Like for Spotify, for instance, you know, I, I'd say up until like a couple of years ago, there actually was room for like large private playlists on Spotify where you could uh, basically reach out to a playlister and go ahead and get your song featured in that playlist and then get more more streams from it. That's no longer really kind of a thing now because Spotify was like, hey, that's money we could be making or we can figure out how to monetize that kind of later later down the line. So you go to this like, you know, playlist era where uh, industry contacts are really, really, really kind of uh, important on that end. And then 
if you look at the current era that that we're in, you know, instead of just trying to get big on a SoundCloud or get playlisted on Spotify, um, really getting playlisted still is a, a main way to get big. Uh, there aren't too many avenues that I see, unfortunately, in order for you to like grow your brand. Um, with the obvious one being, and I, I feel like I'm gonna say, sound like everyone else uh, when I say this, but I really do think it's it's TikTok, uh, specifically short form video content, because if you thought things were competitive like a few years ago, they're even more competitive now. Um, but the, I don't necessarily think that's like a a bad thing it's just the reality right like it, it's as it becomes easier and easier to create consumable content and hopefully i don't reuse content so much but basically because it's so easy to make make music because it's so easy to make video uh there are just so many things that are competing for our time and because there are so many things that are competing for our time that aren't even just music um but like you know, TV, different kinds of things on social media. If you're trying to like build your brand and basically create some like, uh, you know, force some momentum to overcome the, and the strongest inertia, which is like, why should I listen to your, you know, music? You have to stand out. Um, so there's no kind of generic answer for that. I say TikTok, but what I mean is the channel in which your music can get easily discovered is short form uh, video content. Whether it is uh, a 30 second TikTok or a two minute Instagram reel or a two minute YouTube reel on that end. Ton of contents being consumed through, through social media on all those different platforms. And because TikTok is growing the way that it's growing and capturing the mind share of uh, Gen Z and the like young adult and youth, youth market, you're going to start to see this standardization of social media platforms where they're all going to start looking like TikTok. Um, and that's because uh, Facebook and Instagram, uh, they do follow that strategy of kind of copying features of fast growing services and incorporating that, incorporating it, excuse me, into their own. Uh, there's actually like leaked tech emails with Mark Zuckerberg, like legitimately saying, hey, like, why don't I go ahead and, and why don't we just copy features that's faster? Like, we know that they're A-B testing everything perfectly. We know that it's causing them to grow. Why don't we just go, go ahead and do that? I'm curious, but, uh, like with this conversation, if yeah. you had to jump a couple years into the next, the next little op the opportunity that could be on the horizon, what might you think uh, would be that? next phase of opportunities for artists it's a tough question um when 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 i'm talking about artists in general just so that no one pulls out their pitchforks i'm talking about commercial like commercial success um in in your very traditional sense where it's like hey you want to be a touring artist uh and eventually you want to play like arenas or whatnot um there are a lot of ways you know, to, to make money just by having a really sustainable fan base. But if we want to wax philosophical here, I think, I don't know what the next channel is going to look like, but I do see the convergence of, um, of art and entertainment where you can't just be one. You can't just be like really, really good at music and expect things to pop off. You have to be like really good at music and be like an entertainer in some way, shape, or form. And I think the social media influencers get it because for them, it's like, they'll like start on like the influencer end and get really good at content creation and entertaining. And then they're like, oh, if I want to make some residual income, I'm just going to like do some stand up, or I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, you know, start a music project and collab with a bigger artist so that I get a bunch of streams out the gates. So for them, they're like, uh, they're building the audience on whatever social media is popular at the time. And then they're combining it with, um, excuse me, combining it with, with music on that end, which as an artist, you know, hopefully you don't get too disheartened of listening to the podcast because you're like, oh no, like I'm, I, do I need to become like a, a you know, Charlie D'Amelio or something like that? And I, I, I think there's something for everyone. There's a route for everyone because you you want to be authentic about the way that that you grow. 
Um, a great example of this, I think, is this artist named uh, Aviva. So it's A V I V A. Uh, she's a, a touring artist on the, on that end, and she just has like an incredibly loyal fan base. She didn't do a major record label deal or anything like that, but she's cultivated such a connection with her her audience that uh, they'll just repeatedly listen to her music. And because she actually did you know the deals correctly and uh, didn't sign sign with a major or sign too early with a major for that matter, or just write a bad contract, she's able to make a living off of that. Uh, recording revenue and and actually go D to C, uh, which is a fancy way of saying direct consumer with her fans. So the more you can kind of um, cut out the the middleman on that end, I think the more niche you can get. But in terms of where I see the future going for everyone, it's only going to get more competitive, and the bar has been raised now. Like you're you're at the point where it is so easy to just create like a compelling video on your phone. And I think that's why like TikTok is eating these other social media platforms alive right now, because it's just an inherently better social media experience, right? Like you, you look at like, you know, someone posting a picture on Facebook and writing some text and people don't want to consume information that way anymore. So if there are a lot of individuals that are spending a lot of time on these social media platforms and the bar has been raised in terms of how they're used to consuming content, then the bar has been raised for you as an artist to figure out how to get their attention. With that increase in competition though, does come an increase in opportunity too, right? So like, yes, it's gonna be really hard to get attention, but you also don't need to give up a very large portion of your business in order to be like discovered on that end. You just have to figure out a really uh, lean way to go ahead and grow your business. So um, when you're a, a startup and you're trying to go ahead and, and raise money from a venture capitalist, the old school way was like someone has an idea and then before they start building it out, they go out and raise money. However, it became a lot kind of cheaper to actually build a company because all you need is a few nerds and, and a keyboard, you know, to, to type things out. All of a sudden they're like, hey, look, like we're not really going to just give anyone money who has an idea. Like they should actually already have customers. Music's followed a similar model now, right? Where like labels expect you to like have lots of streams, like in some cases, millions of streams before they sign you because that de-risks the, the situation. The good part though, as an artist is that if you're able to figure that out, if you're able to kind of crack that code and, and figure out how to get a couple of million streams on each song that you have, which is easier said than done, right? You're like, well, yeah, of course, Ali. But like, you know, if, if you're able to figure that out, you can actually build a, a good business and raise money or get a record label deal for me it's like it's it's synonymous uh on your own terms uh there's a uh this uh, other term that i like using called brahmin profitability uh which is a fancy way of saying you're break even you know you're not you're not making money you're definitely not making money you're not you're not really in great like livable conditions but uh you know the money coming in exactly matches uh the money coming out and when you're wrong and profitable and you're a, a, a starting business or a starting artist, that's when you're the most dangerous uh, and in, in a good way, because you're able to kind of control, control your destiny. And that way, when you're raising money, you can actually walk away from people. Or if you're, you're uh, trying to get a record label deal, you can walk away from people because you can already tell a label like, look, I'm already a full-time artist. Or if we're, we're telling a VC, it's like, look, we're already growing our business. Like we don't need your money. Like it would be nice for us to be able to grow the business a lot faster if you did, but you know, we're, we're still on a really good growth, growth trajectory. And I, I think um, the more that artists can kind of adopt that mentality of saying, okay, I want to be able to get a record label deal on the best terms possible or just set business deals for my career in the best way possible. And in order to do that, I need to find a very cheap uh, and repeatable way to grow my brand or to grow my audience. Then you're, you're going to be in a good spot. I want to talk a little bit more about you. So I got, I got some questions here. 
Um, first one I want to ask you is like, if you can go back 10 years and, uh, you know, give yourself some, some guidance, some advice, some words of wisdom from you now, like what might you go back and say to yourself? Yeah. Um, I mean, my advice to my younger self would be, um, don't sprint the marathon, even though you, you feel like you have to, to sprint it. Uh, I think that when you're doing an entrepreneurial endeavor or even a creative endeavor, there's a lot of this pressure on you to say, okay, if I'm not putting in, you know, 80 hours a week, there's no way I'm going to be able to, you know, succeed. Um, and there's just so much pressure that you put on yourself because to you, you're, you're unproven. And that I think causes a lot of uh, unforced errors and mistakes, mistakes to be made, uh, that don't necessarily need to happen. So my advice to my younger self would be take care of yourself. Like, yes, work hard. You can still go ahead and put in, you know, your, your, uh, 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week on that end, but you need to have your healthy covenant mechanisms. You need to make sure you're going to therapy. Uh, you need to get your physical exercise. You need to check in on your friends and family. You need to avoid isolating yourself because uh, it really does take a, a, a village. Like a lot of these, uh, like accomplishments that you you've referenced, um, you know, they're not they're not really my own. It's a it's a team. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't um, you know I've been able to build a successful uh, business if it weren't for my my business partners and my employees and. Uh, all my friends and and family because uh, they they carried me along the way most of the way, arguably on that end. So that's what my uh, my advice would be to my younger self. Hmm. So in looking at your entrepreneurial journey, what do you think like the pressure and you know just all around that experience has taught you about yourself? I I think um I think it's important to understand what's motivating you or pushing you to go in a general direction. Um, and you have to ask yourself, okay, am I being motivated by something that is healthy or am I being motivated by something that is unhealthy? So am I being driven to perform these certain things because I uh, actually like them and have genuine interest in them? Or am I pursuing these things because I'm coming from a deep sense of insecurity where if I don't do X, Y, Z, then I'm not enough or, or yeah, yeah. Something, something like that. Um, and I, I think in, in the process of, um, of looking back on how I spent the last few years of my life, I think a lot of my initial, um, motivations did come from a sense of, of, of insecurity. But as I went through that journey of starting a company, I was actually relieved to realize, oh no, like I actually really do like, uh, like doing, doing this a lot. However, you know, I really could have used some healthier coping mechanisms early, uh, early on. <laughs> what would you say is your favorite part about having gotten to be an entrepreneur? I think it's actually recognizing it in others, which is cool. Um, and there, there are a few ways of, um, there are a few ways of explaining that because I, I see it in different ways. So one is, um, you know, looking back at like other artists and seeing them kind of before they manage to hit, hit their professional stride and see how they're able to like create, you know, music videos on like a really lean budget um, and make something work. The other is actually helping um, friends that are trying to get there excuse me, companies off the ground um, and giving them a lot of advice. Uh, and that's fun because, uh, you know, you kind of sit them down and you're like, hey, like, are you really stressed? Yes. And then it's like, okay, well, what's going wrong? And they say everything's going wrong. And they're like, is this normal? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> they're like, oh, okay, cool. So uh, it's, it's fun to, you know, kind of tell people, hey, look, if everything's feels like it's on fire that's that's okay that's actually normal and part of the job and uh you kind of the only way you kind of really get used to it is just uh spending a lot of, a lot of time uh in that that area of, of uncertainty 
of, uh, you know, being on the deep end of the pool. There's like a David Bowie quote uh, somewhere where he's like, hey, you should always be operating like a little bit out of your, uh, your comfort zone on, on that end. Uh, ah, here it is. I'm, I'm pulling it up right now. I'm cheating on the interview because we don't have uh, that guy, Jamie, like Joe Rogan has. Uh, <laughs> but, but it says, uh, if, if you feel safe in your area where you're working in, you're not working in the right area. Always go a little further into the water than you feel you're capable of being in. Go a little bit out of your depth. And when you don't feel that your feet are quite touching the bottom, you're just about in the right place to do something exciting. And uh, I, I do think that that's the, the case with a uh, with a lot of the uh, uh, like entrepreneurs I see and looking back and saying, okay, you know, we, we made something over at, at Tone Den by operating in this environment of uncertainty and, and seeing these cool new kind of products come out of it. That's the way things should be, but that's also how music is made too. Right. So like any kind of new like sound that's inherently made, you know, you're, you're adding a little bit of a, a little bit of like an extra, uh, you know, bit of knowledge to the world that didn't exist before on, mm-hmm. on that end. So it, it's, it's same, same, but different. That's what I'm getting at. <laughs> so like throughout your life, you know, you've, you've had bosses, I'm sure you've, you've been a leader. What do you feel like are the most important characteristics of a great leader? Yeah, I mean, this applies less to myself, but I, I'm just thinking about my business partner, Tim, and uh, I, I think resilience is is one. You, you have to be tough. Um, you have to uh, be willing to roll with the punches, punches in that sense. Uh, two, you need to be determined. Um, there's a, a great uh, article that was uh, put out by Paul Graham, who's the founder of Y Combinator, which is a, a really kind of famous Silicon Valley incubator, and it's called How Not to Die. And the moral of the article is basically, hey, if you want to be a successful startup, and I think it also applies if you want to be a successful musician too, you just have to not go out of business. So <laughs> as long as you're you know, continuously making music and you, you don't give up. I'm not saying it's going to be a, a pleasant and joyful ride, but, you know, that's one way of really, really, really increasing your odds of, uh, of getting acquired as a startup or IPOing as a startup or, uh, or, you know, finding success in your career as a musician. So we've got resilience. We have a d- determination on, on that end. Um, I believe that um, being able to remain even keel is is also really important. Like when I think about Tim, um, he's always very calm and cool and collected, even in periods of, of great uncertainty. I'm working on that, <laughs> but um, I, I think as a as a leader, it's it's really important to show like, look, yes, like I might, you know, be. Uh, you know, be a little bit scared about what the future holds for us, but let's actually figure out a plan here that'll give it, get us out of, of whatever issue or challenge we're currently facing right now. Yes, the odds may not be low. They may not be in our favor, but as long as we don't give up and we execute on the plan, uh, we'll, we'll be able to pull through. And uh, he's managed to do, do that uh, multiple times uh with me in his presence and i'm like whoa this is how uh this is how you lead on on that end so at this point you know you mentioned you're 30 with where you're at like what does growth look like for you now i think um that's a good question uh i think growth for me now following my my own own interests uh, which might differ from from music technology and seeing what I can do with everything that I've learned thus far right so I feel like uh you know the last seven eight years of my life have almost been a blur to a certain extent in terms of um running at a million miles an hour trying to make sure that uh, tone and survives and is successful while also providing value to musicians. And now that, uh, you know, we've, we've sold the business and it's, it's reaching this more, uh, kind of mature state. 
it, it's figuring out what I would be be interested in doing next. Um, so that I think growth for me is kind of discovering what's interesting to me in this fa phase of my life, um, as opposed to you know what interested me when I was uh, 21 or, or 22. So mm. I don't have a great answer for you, but that's where, where I'm I think that's at. a great answer. It's like, like <laughs> getting to know yourself a little bit. I think for a lot of people when they're just entering the workforce or let's say, I mean, you could even be mid in your professional career at a certain point you, you start realizing, Hey, I'm not really interested in this thing that I'm doing right now. Um, I'm just speaking generally here. Um, at which point you, you really start to explore and try to figure out what you really like. And I think for a lot of people, they incorrectly assume that working in the music industry is going to be that answer for them at any stage. Cause they're like, well, music's important to me. So I should like working in the music industry, but it's a lot more pleasant to work in another industry and enjoy music, whether it's going to a concert or a festival or, or playing in your own room as opposed to actually working in the music industry from like a career advancement standpoint on that end. Um, but what I'm, you know, what I'm getting at here is that, uh, you know, I, I think for, for me, I, I've been able to build up a, a certain skill set, uh, figuring out how to build something from, from scratch. I've also observed, you know, some of the most creative people in the world uh, build uh, brands inexpensively. And now the question is like, okay, what do I do with, with that knowledge? Is it, uh, you know, build another for-profit enterprise? Um, is it, you know, build a nonprofit? Uh, do I, uh, you know, it, it's really open-ended. So that's what I'm kind of mm -hmm. trying to figure out where it's like, okay, I was able to learn a lot from my experience building this company. And I was able to learn a lot from the music industry. I have a love hate relationship with, but um, you're not you alone. A lot of, yeah, yeah, you learn a lot of things from it. So now it's a, a what's next kind of question. I got a couple more questions for you here as we're starting to wrap up. Okay. If you look at moments when you've been under a lot of pressure and maybe moments in the future when you will be under a lot of pressure, best case scenario, what kinds of things are, is, are you saying to yourself? Are, is your self talk in your mind like, where when you're under a lot of pressure, still trying to, you know, maintain that flow? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a few things, right? So one is uh, kind of silencing your, your inner critic. Uh, you can do this through like externalization almost. So uh, my therapist mentioned that uh, there was like a cancer patient. I was going through uh, chemotherapy. And one of the things that her therapist had recommended was actually like drawing out like her tumor and then you know kind of, kind of externalizing it that way and saying like hey like I'm gonna beat you or like you're you're not as significant as you think you are and it actually extended the length of her prognosis by like like two or three like months on on that end um, but I, I think in the context of like you know those, those voices that pop up in your head that are like oh you're not good enough or like of course you'll find yourself in this, this situation um really like that that voice isn't like actually you it's like you know the result of uh however you were brought up or whatever trauma you ended up experiencing whereas in reality like you you are kind of good enough on that end now of course it sounds like you know great in theory to externalize so for me it's more so like okay is there something that i could do to take my mind off of things that isn't directly the problem at hand at least for a short period of time so that i can revisit it in a slightly calmer state so that's like, you know, going to the gym, going out on a bike ride, um, that kind of stuff actually works. Um, and then beyond that, um, I now have the luxury of being able to say, Hey, like you were in this really weird, you've been in this situation multiple times before, and you were able to figure out how to, you know, get through it. You'll be able to do it again. If you are not in that situation, just know that like, don't give up and you you ideally will, will be able to to figure it out. I think on a more open ended note, though, um, a lot of things really do involve luck. Like you, th there are plenty of um, you know individuals that uh, work hard, do everything right, but they don't end up 
experiencing like positive financial outcomes or positive emotional outcomes. And I think that's just life, right? Like there's, um, oh man, there's some Star Trek quote where, uh, um, I gotta look this up, dude. I gotta look this up. It is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness. That is life. Um, and I think it's, it's important to wrestle with that too, as you try out like new, uh, creative or new business ventures too. Like not everything's going to, uh, go your way and you could make a lot of the right decisions and do a lot of the right things, but things just don't work out. And I mean, even looking back at Tone Den, there were so many times that, you know, we were, uh, you know, death was like knocking on the door for us and you know we just narrowly escaped it we come out with a new new feature or we secure funding or or something like that uh and if just one of those things had gone wrong you know we wouldn't be having this podcast conversation um so a, a lot of it uh, really does boil down to luck but i think recognizing that too is also helpful because it makes it easier to remain kind of calmer in those situations where you're like, Hey, as long as I know that I've done everything that I can do, then it's just not in the cards and we'll have to try it the next time. Mm. I love that. I love that. Like just got to do your best and let the chips fall where they may. It's a very humbling pill to swallow. I've got two more quick questions for you here. Second to last one. I'd love to hear about some books you've read top books that have had the greatest impact on you throughout your life? Oh man, top books. Uh, I like uh, I'm Fooled by Randomness by, uh, by Nassim Taleb. So um, Nassim Taleb is a, he's a hedge fund manager um, who predicted the great financial crisis. And the way that he makes money is by uh, losing money for many years in a row and then in, you know, one year, he'll make back, you know, all the losses that he had for five to 10 years uh, and way more. So he basically gets outsized returns from betting on once in a lifetime events that happen to happen every, every Black day. Swans. I matter. think I've yes. read a book about yeah, this. Yeah. Yep. So he, he, he uh, wrote The Black Swan, but I like Fooled by Randomness. Uh, better because it does talk about that because I, I think there's um I mean it it's a human tendency but I'd argue it's also a very American tendency to compare yourself to others like you're you're constantly comparing yourself to uh, you know people that are the same uh, age as you or younger than you uh, or even older than you that are seeing success in whatever aspect of success that you want to see it in whether it's building a technology company or uh, becoming a successful musician, um, being a good designer. I don't know. There are a million things that people want to be good at, right? And I think when you look at other people that see success um, that are somewhat similar to you or close to you, that inner voice in your head is like, what are they doing that I am not that is causing them to see this success when I, you know, I am objectively like, better or, or what yeah there are a lot of you know ways that people have this this internal dialogue and what reading that book really helped me with was that uh you know sometimes there there are a lot of hardworking people excuse me that are successful but there are also a lot of like very lucky people that were were successful and then there were also a lot of lucky people that are successful that aren't able to maintain how they got there because you know if the thing that they're doing that caused them to achieve that success isn't sustainable in a, in a certain way eventually they end, end up losing it so for him like the analogies are really easy because it's all about like stock picking so like you know you'll have like new money managers come in and basically get lucky for the first like three or four years so they think the hot stuff and then the uh you know the market effectively turns and because they were operating on such a risky strategy, it all just blows up in their face. But because they were getting, um, you know, lost in their own sauce or, or high on the supply, 
they would think that like they're geniuses or that, you know, everyone else that isn't kind of making money in the same way that they are is dumb. And for him, he like watched that unfold for like a decade and he's like, okay, you know, this is just a, a human kind of tendency on that and did a lot of research on it. So I, I think um, I'm going to go a lot of different directions in book recommendations, but I think that one <laughs> that would calm me down the most let's put it that way <laughs> any other just titles you want to just throw out there honorable mentions uh yeah i mean there's like a, a naval uh, almanac that one's pretty cool too it's very tech bro of me to say um so naval was that uh uh excuse me um ceo of angel list and angel investor um he's a libertarian I don't agree with him a lot politically. So it's called the Almanac of Naval uh, Ravikant. But uh, there's a lot of really good uh, information in there, uh, especially like, like self-orienting, like goal, goal uh, motivation stuff. I also think that he describes a lot of like the, the modern economy very well. And he talks about how uh, there's this shift away from like corporations and towards like individuals being businesses and brands. And I think that's the direction we're going in for a lot of individuals that are either in music or in sales and marketing. Like you're now kind of expected to produce a product, but also be like a media company as well. Um, and it's, it's a lot of pressure for musicians, but it's also a lot of pressure for businesses. And that bar is just, been raised like if if you can produce like highly engaging video content if you figure out how to do that for your music career and your music career doesn't take off don't even worry about it because someone someone around you is going to need that skill trust me <laughs> <Not him. laughs> mm. last question this has been freaking awesome man if there's one lesson one takeaway from what you've been through, your story, your journey, what would you say that is? Like one mantra, what you're, what you're all about to pull from your life experience, what might you say? It's about the journey and not the destination, uh, which is a little bit cliche to say, but uh, having kind of been through these climactic events, uh, what you realize is that it, it really was like the, you know, the, the it really was the friends you made along the way. That's like the real, real value. I know it sounds so corny, man, but uh, when I uh, when I look at the the dots and connect them, looking backwards instead of forward, that's what puts the biggest smile on my face. It's like, okay, this happened, so then I met this person, and now they're in my life, and then that caused me to meet this person, so now they're in my life. And you think about all these, all these little events that needed to occur in order for your world as you know it to be around you, which is like you had said, the the, the butterfly effect uh, to to bring this full circle. But um, that's that's kind of my uh, takeaway, and it's hard to live by because you you do get wrapped up in things, uh, you get really wrapped up in in expectations and desired outcomes but uh you gotta say hey remember this is supposed to be fun ish <laughs> just keep telling yourself that <laughs> it pays to smell the roses well ali man this is this has been awesome talking to you definitely you know admire you you know what you've gone through of course what you've built but also um you know the the kind of person it takes to to do what you've done um definitely appreciate you coming on the show uh, thank you so much, man. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for having me.